I'm Michael Montero and you're watching The Neutral Corner for the week of October 17th. Well, boxing fans, there's a lot going on this week, a lot to talk about, but first, let's get into the ring walk. This week's question comes from YouTube, and it's from Isisco, and he asks, Danny Garcia receives a lot of well-deserved criticism for facing Rod Selka. Now, Canelo, on the other hand, has a reputation for fighting the best yet he has a similar name on his resume. He fought Jose Cito Lopez, a 140 pounder. What's the difference between Salka and Lopez? I understand Canelo had no available opponent due to politics, but couldn't he have fought someone in his weight class? Nothing against Canelo, I like him, but I'd like to think the same criteria applies to all fighters. I just find it bizarre that Danny beat the boogeyman in his division and Canelo hasn't done the same. Lara is very good, but he's not a destroyer. Danny fought at 143 a couple times and was shit on, but is a Canelo doing the same thing, fighting at 155 pounds? All right, man, uh, pretty good question. And I understand where you're going with this. Let's start with the comparison between Jose Cito Lopez and Rod Selka. To me, there's no comparison here. Rod Selka was a guy who is virtually unranked, who really has beat or fought nobody of note. Now Lopez, yeah, he's limited. He's a natural 140 pounder when Canelo fought him. They really had no business fighting, I agree with you. But look, Lopez, he has victories over, I'm just looking at his box record right here because I forgot about some of these. He, he beat Mike Dallas. I remember the split decision loss to Jesse Vargas. A lot of people feel that Lopez won that fight. Of course, the victory over Ortiz. He's hung tough against, been competitive against really just about everybody he's fought. And he had some wins on his resume before Canelo fought him. So there's the difference between Selka and Lopez. Now you talked about Iris Landi Lara not being the killer that Matisse was. And you're right about that as far as power punching. But Lara was kind of a boogeyman at 154 pounds. And quite frankly, he still is. And if ever there was a guy that Canelo didn't need to fight, and it, his promoter and his team wanted him to stay away from, it was Irizlandi Lara. So for Canelo to take that fight, and also remember, he fought Mayweather years before he was ready for a fight like that. And of course, he did it for the money. We get it. It's prize fighting. But he was not ready for Mayweather. He took that fight. The fight with Lara was a tough fight. So I think that considering how young Canelo is, he tends to get a pass. And he's never been the champ at 154. He held a title, but he was never seen as the man. Garcia was the man at 140 pounds. And when you're the man, when you're the undisputed champion of a division, there's just more responsibility that comes along with that. So. I think all those factors come into play, and that's why Canelo tends to get a pass for some things, and uh, Danny Garcia got a little bit of criticism. Now, now look, there's also political aspects here. Canelo is a cash cow. He's Mexican. He's aligned with uh, Golden Boy Promotions, who, who, you know, they're one of the power brokers in the sport. All of those things play a factor here, you know. He just has a bigger fan base, and therefore you get to get away with a little more. His fight with Miguel Cotto, I hate the catch weight, but considering that Cotto really is a natural welterweight, his best weight was 147, and he's blown up himself. And then you look at Canelo, he's working his way up to 160 pounds. Again, I think he gets a little bit of a pass because he's fighting one of the best fighters, one of the top five or so fighters of this last generation in Miguel Cotto. And he's already fought Floyd Mayweather. Danny Garcia, you know, he's fought a couple of catchweights at 143 pounds, a little over 140 against guys we didn't really care, right? The fight with Lamont Peterson, I believe that was at 143. That was a good matchup. But again, that fight should have happened the night that Garcia fought Selka, and it should have been at 147 pounds. So the criticism, 
I think it's justifiable. I get your point. I get where you're going with all this, but hopefully I answered some of your questions. I just think Canelo gets a little bit more of a pass than Garcia because less was expected of him because he wasn't quote unquote the man at the time he took some of his soft touches. Okay, now let's get into last week's action. Over there in England and Manchester, a couple of UK prospects, I think, really proved they weren't prospects last week. They had performances that elevated them, especially the guy in the main event, Terry Flanagan. He scored a second round knockout over Diego Magdaleno, who I thought was going to challenge him and push him some rounds. I thought this was going to be the toughest challenge of his career. Flanagan made a big, big statement. Uh, he dropped Diego Magdaleno three times in the second round. Really threw some great combinations, man. He mixed up his punches very, very well, especially once he had Magdaleno hurt. Showed some real killer instinct. This was the first defense of the vacant title he won earlier in July. And uh, one thing I noticed that was really, really apparent was the size difference. Uh, it looked like a welterweight versus a featherweight in there. I mean, a really, really big size difference. And, and Flanagan just kind of mowed down Magdaleno. Uh, you know, one thing I did notice, though, he did take some punches. Diego was able to get in there as the much smaller guy and land some shots. Now, this could have been Flanagan just saying, hey, nothing you have is going to hurt me. And he just kind of put defense by the wayside and just was all offense. Or it could be that he needs to work on some defense a little bit, especially his head movement. I didn't really see any head movement. Now in the co-feature, Liam Smith scored a seventh round TKO over John Thompson. And this was for a vacant uh, 154 pound title. It was a scary, scary knockout in the seventh round. Uh, I think it was a right hand. He set it up with the left hand. I think he came over with some looping, uh, almost left hooks. 45s, we used to call them 45s. It's like a mix between an uppercut and a hook. Just kind of range finders as uh, Thompson was backing out. He's kind of backing out on the ropes, backing away. He used the left hand kind of as a range finder. Smith did, and then just came over with the right hand. Landed kind of high in the head. I want to say it landed up here somewhere, but Thompson landed face first. He was in really, really bad shape. And he's been hurt in the past. He's shown that he's a little bit chinny. So Smith got the job done. But here's the thing, I, I believe this fight was even after six rounds. Uh, many had Thompson ahead. I myself had it four rounds to two for Thompson. Liam Smith showed a lot of liabilities. He, he was really getting out boxed in spots by Thompson, who has shown some, some boxing craft. Now, Thompson keeps his hands down, his chin was way out there, but he had some skills and some quickness and some athleticism, and that was giving Smith some problems. So up until that KO, this fight was in question for him. It's good experience because he gets to take this and go back to the drawing board. But when I compare Liam Smith to Terry Flanagan, obviously Flanagan is here and Smith is here. Smith has some things he needs to work on. For Flanagan, you know, um, he has a title now obviously and I think he's a major player in the lightweight division. For Smith, uh, he's in a division that, you know, I think is a little deeper, especially if he crosses the pond into America. There's some fighters at 54 that would give him a lot of problems. So he's got to go back to the drawing board and work on some things, but a good performance from him. And uh, the fight that just happened here in, uh, in the States, um, I'm re recording this Tuesday night, Gerald Washington, El Gallo Negro, undefeated American heavyweight, just scored a draw. A, uh, I guess they call it a mixed draw against Amir Mansour. One judge had it for Mansour, I believe seven rounds to three. This was a 10 round fight. One judge had it for Washington, six rounds to four. And Pat Russell, who actually uh, refs a lot of fights and he judges a lot of fights. He's a veteran, I, you know, I really trust his judgment. He had it a draw. I was watching this fight and I scored it a draw. I could see why many fans had it six rounds to four for Mansour. I don't, I don't know how you could give Washington more than five rounds. Maybe you could score six rounds for Washington if you really, really preferred his uh, technical boxing. Here's the thing. For Washington, he escapes with a draw here, and I'm totally cool with that because Mansoor, for all his aggression, 
Landed a lot of body shots, but didn't really land a lot of accurate, crisp punches until the late stages of the fight. The first four rounds, not a lot happened, but Washington completely controlled the action. It was boring and dull, but he controlled the action. Now in the middle rounds, things got interesting. And there were some close rounds where Washington might only land a few really, really crisp shots, but his punches were straighter. They were head shots, they were jabs and right hands. Mansoor was coming forward and lunging and just winging shots. I mean, literally they were roundhouse kind of shots. It almost looked like a MMA fighter the way he was throwing his shots. And uh, I, I understand why he was doing that. It's because Washington was covering up down the middle. So he came around and it started to work. He started to land some body shots and started to really wear down the bigger guy. And uh, I thought some of those middle rounds were close. Could have went either way. But rounds six, seven, eight, nine, I thought those rounds clearly Mansoor controlled. And again, it was kind of ugly what he was doing in there, but he was doing so much more work and he was landing a lot of hard body shots. But every so often Washington was sneaking in right hands and he actually busted uh, Mansoor's ear open with a punch. It was split right here. His ear was split open and he busted up both eyes. In fact, right after the fight, Mansoor put on sunglasses because both eyes were busted up. There was blood coming out of the nose and the mouth and everything. And there wasn't a scratch on Washington. So obviously Washington was doing something in there. But look, for him, um, he's got to go back to the drawing board here too. I give Washington a lot of credit. I've been very, very critical of uh, American heavyweights in recent times, especially the guys lined up with Al Heyman in the PBC for not taking these types of challenges, right? This is the type of fight for Washington. Now he's got 10 rounds of film. He can go back and watch with his trainer and he can see what he did wrong and he can learn from this and he can go back and, 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 and improve. It's on him to do this. We're gonna find out how real or not he is. Look, there are other guys who are prospects I believe he was 16-0 going in. Now he's 16-0-1. A lot of guys out there with 16 fights with Amir Mansour lunging at him and just going for it and throwing hard shots. And he was. He was pressuring the hell out of Washington. A lot of heavyweight prospects out there would have folded. They would have folded. And Washington didn't. So to me, he showed some resolve. He, he finished the fight, but yeah, he's not ready for the top guys. He's nowhere near ready. He can take this, he can learn from it, and he can come back. One thing I noticed, just, just a, a glaring problem with Washington, no head movement. Absolutely no head movement. And not very much upper body movement to speak of. Uh, he's very, very good at getting in and getting out with his legs. He actually moves pretty gracefully with his legs for a big man. But the upper body is very stiff. And... Um, the punches, there's really no left hook there. It's, it's jabs and right hands. Got to work on a left hook and got to work on the head movement because if Mansoor was able to catch him, uh, there's other guys out there who are taller who shoot straighter punches. They're going to see the holes and fill them and uh, he's going to have problems. But for now, El Gallo Negro gets away with a draw and he continues to stay undefeated. One of the top American heavyweight prospects. So there's a little fight going on this week. Maybe you heard about it. This guy, uh, Gennady Triple G Golovkin, is going up against this guy, David Lemieux. And there's this guy, Chocolatito, fighting on the co-feature. I'm not even gonna break that fight down in this video because um, I did a whole video on that card. It's Montero Unboxing's fight preview, big drama show style. Look for it, that should be out within the next day or two. That's gonna be an entire 20, 30 minute video dedicated to that card. I want to talk real briefly about the PBC action coming up this week. We already had the heavyweight fight I talked about tonight, but tomorrow night from Glendale, Arizona, uh, we have Devon Alexander going up against Aaron Martinez. And uh, both of these guys are coming off losses, right? Uh, Devon Alexander, this is his first fight of 2015. His last fight was in December against Amir Khan. 
He lost pretty decisively in that fight. He's lost two of his last three. And he's going up against Martinez, who just lost to Robert Guerrero uh, this June. He's lost three of his last four. In that fight with Guerrero, he did have the ghost hurt. I was actually ringside for that fight. And Martinez just could not close the show. But both of these guys are in big need of a win. I actually think this fight's going to be really, really ugly. I'm not very interested in it. The winner of the fight lines himself up for another one of these, you know, PBC type events. There'll maybe be a, an opponent for, I don't know, maybe Errol Spence. They start to step him up or something like that. The fight that I'm interested in on this card is the UK's Lee Selby. Coming over here to uh, for the first defense of the featherweight title that he won earlier this year against Fernando Montiel, right? Selby is an exciting fighter. And, you know, th this guy has a lot of potential. There's a lot of people that are very high on Selby. This is his first fight outside of the UK. And Fernando Montiel, I think, represents, uh, obviously, the most experienced, most accomplished opponent of his pro career. Montiel's 36. He turned pro at 17 as a flyweight. And this is going to be at featherweight. You know, he's only had one dominant loss. He's got several losses, but there was one dominant loss. That was uh, a second round knockout to Nonito Donaire. I want to say in 2011. Don't quote me, but I think it was 2011. So he's going to bring all that experience into this fight, but he's going to be undersized. I think youth's going to be served in this one. I want to see what Selby does. If he can dominate Montejo and stop him the way that Nonito Donaire did, it just elevates him. This is going to be used as a measuring stick. It's his first fight in America. It's a lot of pressure, but if he responds to that pressure, I'm not expecting a second round KO like Donaire got, but mid-rounds KO or something like that, that'd look really, really good for Selby, and it sets him up for some big business next year. There's another PBC card this Friday from Chicago, where uh, Andres Fonfara, the exciting Polish fighter that gave uh, Donna Stevenson fits last year and upset Julio Cesar Chavez, here in Los Angeles earlier this year. He's going up against Nathan Cleverly. And this is a guy who, uh, UK fighter, quality fighter. He's fought in America twice. You know, he's got some losses, but the only guy he really lost to in dominant fashion was against Sergey Kovalev. Uh, I believe it was fourth round TKO. That was really the only elite level opponent he's faced. So I expect Fonfara to get a stoppage win here. I'm expecting uh, probably a mid-round TKO type stoppage. I think Fanfara is hungry. He really seems to be a guy that uh, reminds me of a lot of Mexican fighters. Started out very, very young. I want to say he was fighting at like welterweight or something when he first went pro. He was really, really drained at weight. It might have been middleweight or something, don't quote me, but I, it was really, really low down the weight scale for such a tall guy. I want to say he's like 6'2". So, um, I think he got busted for a banned substance. I want to say it was a diuretic, which makes sense. And then he moved to light heavyweight, and uh, he's looked good. You know, he, he performed well against Stevenson. He performed later, better later in that fight than he did in the beginning. It's almost like he kind of discovered a confidence in that fight. And ever since then, he's looked really good. So I, I like Fonfara to be exciting and score an exciting type of win. He's going to eat some leather though. Cleverly is going to land some shots and he's going to go for it. But I think it's going to be an exciting fight. It's in Chicago with a high Polish contingency, so it should be a fun crowd. Uh, the co-feature, Kohai Kono, Koki Kameda are fighting for a 115-pound title that Kono won last year. It was a vacant title he won last year. I don't think he's fought since he won that vacant title. It's worthless. It's another worthless boxing title. To me, this looks like a way to give Koki Kamita a title because Kamita, way more marketable. Let's get him a title and get him in another fight. So I like Kamita in that one big. And then Saturday, there's a PBC card before the big pay-per-view event in New York. This is a fight card in Fairfax, Virginia, which is a suburb of Washington, DC. Lamont Peterson, who lives in DC, headlines the card against Felix Diaz. For those of you who don't know who Felix Diaz is, 
Undefeated as a pro, southpaw, good amateur background as a Dominican fighter. Uh, he was a two-time Olympian for the Dominican Republic. He won a gold medal in the 2008 games. But so far as a pro, he's fought nobody. So this is a big step up in opposition for him. Uh, for Peterson, this is his first fight back since the controversial majority decision loss to Danny Garcia. I believe it was in April. And uh, you know, this is the fight I was talking about before, 143 pound catch weight. So I'm not particularly excited about this one, but um, this one's on NBC also, I should mention that. Um, it's an afternoon card here in the States. So, uh, you know, hey, if you're hanging out, doing a fight party for the Golovkin Lemieux thing and you're tailgating early, you could put on the PBC card as a warm up. But uh, I, I like Peterson in that fight. And, um, you know, I'm not quite sure where he goes from there. Maybe they put Peterson against the, uh, the winner of the Alexander uh, Martinez fight. I just, oh, man, none of those fights interest me. But, you know, um, them's the breaks. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, please check out my video, the Golovkin Lemieux fight preview. I break all that down. And uh, that's it, guys. I'll see you next week.